Well, good morning. We uh, are going to be thinking around the theme of God, our creator, this morning. And the first song we're going to sing is one that uh, has a kind of interesting history. We're told that there was a poem written by St. Francis of Assisi a good long time ago. St. Francis had some interesting characteristics. One of them was preaching to birds and talking to animals and calling them to uh, proclaim God and, uh, and to worship the Lord, which I guess is, uh, <clears throat> is appropriate. I'm not sure it's awfully effective, but... Um, <laughs> and this hymn was written in the first part of the last century, around 1900. But there's two verses, the last two. The first two are really kind of nature songs, and that's appropriate. God is the creator of those things. But more recently, the last two verses have been added. So let's stand and sing, and these last two verses, as well as the initial two, will be uh, uh, a way of looking at what God has done in our creation. <laughs> We are uh, going to fill our minds with the greatness of God, and this next song helps us do that. Um, it comes close to a challenge, and that is that a lot of contemporary music is performance music rather than congregational music, and so I usually try and avoid them on Sunday mornings. They're good to listen to, but they're hard to. But this is a song that's sort of on the borderline, uh, but it does enable us to talk about the wonder and greatness of our God. So let's do our best. Let's stand and uh, join in describing our indescribable God. <clears throat> there is a power of God in nature that uh, causes us to worship, but there is an even greater power of God in salvation that causes us to say, you are amazing. So we're going to celebrate the amazing grace of our God. That's a wonderful song to celebrate the goodness and grace of God. The next song, though, shifts not the wonder, but the mood. The style of music is very different. And I know this is a song that almost no, none of you will know. But I just want you to... Feed your heart on the words that you're going to be singing. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. Those he loves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. You know, there's times in life where uh, that's... All you need to know and sometimes all you can know. So sing along as you're able to enter into the, to the words of the song, but enjoy the words even if the melody is, it's simple, but it's new. There's a, a not all that current song, but uh, when our daughter was dying, um, we played it for her over and over because one of the key lines was just be held. Don't, and I can't remember even the other words in the song, but it's about, it's not about you holding on, just be held. And the Lord holds us and keeps us. My wife blindsided me just a few minutes before we got up by reminding me, um, and I'd forgotten she was entirely appropriate in what she did, but it, it just caught me off guard a bit because I hadn't thought about it, that this is the day my mother died, May 15th. And, um, just thinking about that, my mother was a wonderful lady who was known um, a little outside her own family, and she poured herself into our lives. She was uh, a woman who represented Christ to me. She died on the same day that Francis Schaeffer died. And when Francis Schaeffer died, Christians all over the world couldn't help but express their appreciation. And uh, Elizabeth reminded me of what I said, I think, probably publicly, that... Um, when Francis Schaeffer got to the gates of heaven and when Patty and Rick got to the gates of heaven, they heard exactly the same thing. Although one was well known, one had invested her life just in her family and a few others around that. They both heard the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because the Lord doesn't call us to be who we aren't. 
He holds us fast as who and what we are. So pardon that personal reminiscence, but uh, it's just on my heart this morning. So Father, we come to you with great gratitude that you are not only the sovereign, indescribable God of creation power, but you are the gracious, redeeming, loving God of salvation power. And those whom you delight do not to their own merit, but your undeserved love, you hold fast and keep. We thank you that's true for Darwin in his, in his uh, physical need, for Sharon and her anxiety for him, for those people and those concerns that are on our heart right now. Thank you that we can just be held. That as your son said, um, the one who comes unto me, I will under no conditions cast out that I keep them and protect them and watch over them. Pray that as we open your word and as we move to your table, that we would know your presence, even in, as we have in some of these songs that we've sung. May you be glorified in our time together in your word. In Christ's name, amen. The last two days have brought some significant things within our culture. They are symptoms, but they are significant symptoms. As you know, on Friday, the Obama administration sent notices to schools all across the country related to bathroom facilities. And on one level, it's just bathroom facilities. And it was said to be a directive. It wasn't law, but it came with the coercive power of, if you don't follow this, then we will cut off your sources. And earlier in the week, the Attorney General had made a statement related to one of the states who was out of conformity to what their thing that schools must allow students to use, not just restrooms, but locker rooms, which conform to their gender identity, which is a personal choice that is made related to that. And incredibly, the Attorney General compared this to the racial issue and then went on to say it is about a distinction that makes no difference. And you begin to think about the reality that biology and uh, the stamping on every chromosome of our body is now said to be a distinction without a difference. Someone that defies logic, it defies science, and it defies the accumulated human wisdom. But in our particular time, we are... Uh, moving in these strange directions, and the government has used what amounts to blackmail to coerce people into following their agenda outside of law. Another meeting occurred on Friday, which is equally significant, but not very well known. As a matter of fact, it was intended to be a secret meeting of 150 life scientists, and uh, they were having a meeting at Harvard Medical School on the subject of uh, fabricating a synthetic human genome that could lead the way to creating humans with certain kinds of traits and even to create human beings that had no biological parents. So the discussion was whether this should be created, this entirely synthetic human genome, and then you could monitor it for traits and build in some desired, for example, you could design uh, humans who were especially equipped to be soldiers and others who might especially be equipped to be musicians and others who especially might be equipped to be, you name it, scientists. And you begin to think about that. It was supposed to be a private meeting, but the New York Times had a, an article on it. Some found the article or the issue too disturbing to keep it quiet. We live in strange and significantly dangerous times in many ways. We have this, the wonder of what human beings are able to do in terms of sequencing and now perhaps synthesizing the human genome. The problem is not whether it can be done, the weather issue is whether it should be done. We've got another part of our culture rewriting the human biological reality. 
And then out of the same roots come a whole worldview that tells us that humanity really doesn't have that much significance in and of itself. For example, to quote Richard Dawkins, humans have already wondered about the meaning of life. Life has no other purpose than to perpetuate the survival of our DNA. So Dawkins at different times has called human beings gene machines, uh, G-E-N-E, -E, because that's why we exist, to perpetuate the gene, although it's not clear why. Or the uh, physicist Lawrence Krauss observes, in light of the claim that there is dark matter that makes up most of reality, he said, humans are just a bit of pollution. If you got rid of us and all the stars and all the galaxies and all the planets and all, and, and all the aliens and everybody, then the universe would largely be the same. We're completely irrelevant. Or Alex Rosenberg, the author of The Atheist's Guide to Reality, he continues the theme with these words. What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. What is the meaning of life? Ditto. Does history have any meaning or purpose? It's full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Well, at least he thought that Shakespeare was worth quoting. But um, what is the purpose of life? What is the significance of life? I could go on, but it gets too depressing to ponder. But what does God's word teach us? What does it mean when in our doctrinal statement we have the declaration, we believe that God directly created human beings, male and female, in his image? as the climax of his very good creation. And that's what I want to think with you about this morning. I'd like you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 31, to read them together and, and form the basis of what we're going to look at from God's word this morning. We're in the account of creation. This is the sixth day we're partway through it, and it says in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after his likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. Now, I just want to say out of this passage, three things. And you'll notice in your outline. First of all, God's word tells us that we as human beings have a special origin. It tells us that we have a special dignity. And it tells us that we have a divine responsibility. All of that is put within this passage, which becomes the seedbed for a huge amount of what the Bible wants us to think about, what it means to be human, what it means to live as we are living in this world. Now, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 begins the whole account of the Bible and God's account of reality with that simple statement, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in some ways, that is the most significant verse in all of the Bible. Everything flows from that. If that is not true, then nothing else really matters about all that the Bible has to say. But it begins by telling us in simple and yet profound language the great truth that everything that exists comes from the hand of God himself. And then, as we were, to, were we to follow through the passage, we would notice that the earth was created formless and empty. And so the first three days are about God forming this creation that he has made. And then in days four to six, about him filling the days uh, the, the earth that he has made. And we come at this point to the climax of that process. 
So let's just first notice what this passage tells us about the fact that we have a unique, a special origin. We are God's direct creation. Now, the first thing I think this passage tells us is that humans in the biblical worldview are the climax of creation. On one sense, we wait until this mounting working of God comes to the end, but it isn't the end, it's the climax. Everything's been building in this particular direction. We can see it. In chapter 1, humans are described as created by the word of God. And when God creates, he says, it is very good. He said, it is good, it is good, it is good. And now human beings enter, and it is very good. Or if we were to turn chapter 2, we would discover, and we'll come back to this in a moment, that there's a, a, a parallel account of creation, not a different one, but a parallel one. And that tells us that human beings are the creatures of God's hand. He formed Adam. He spoke everything else into existence. He formed Adam, and he breathed into him the breath of life. So in both of those ways, the recognition that human beings are not the result of random processes, they are not the end result of uh, the strange movements of, of unplanned choices, they are the creatures of God intended to be the crown of his creation. There is a sense in which man is created by God and for God, and the earth is created for man under God and for his glory. It is his world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the psalmist will say. And yet man is the climax of that. And he is created by a direct creation. Now, I think it's important to notice this. In chapter 1, we have the account of man's creation given in a summary fashion. So it simply says that God said, let us, and he creates, and it is so. But in chapter 2, we have the process by which that occurred. If you want, chapter 1 is kind of the summary. Chapter 2 is the play-by-play, -play, the creation of the man, the uh, events that surround the creation of the man is being put into the garden, his uh, relationship to the animals, and then finally, at a later stage in that process, the creation of the woman. And so we have those two that flow together. But both of them come back to the same issue, that man is created by a special, unique act of God himself. Now, I just want to uh, stand back from this for a moment and notice that there are many things about Genesis chapter 1 and our understanding on it where sincere Bible-believing Christians differ and can differ. There are questions that we come to, and we will never know this side of heaven the final answer to some of those questions. And we can debate and differ about the age of the earth and some of the meaning of the days and those kind of things. But one central fact remains unequivocal and clear. And that is there was an original pair of human beings created directly and intentionally by God. However you understand how these chapters unfold, we come to the place where God made Adam and Eve. And they are historical beings who had a real existence. And it is the Old Testament that will continue that. So when we get to chapter 5, we will come back to God made Adam and Eve in a count that is now into clearly into history, not talking about beginnings, but about the unfolding of human life. Chapter 9 in verse 6, it will talk about God creating after the image of man to Noah, well into human history. And when we come to the New Testament, we find the Lord Jesus clearly accepted that there was an original couple. In the middle of a debate on divorce, he comes into the discussion and says, in answer to their questions, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and commanded a man to leave his father and mother and quotes from Genesis chapter 2. And Jesus clearly is accepting the book of Genesis and the account of Genesis and God creating Adam and Eve as a literal fact is the basis on which he is going to argue about the nature of marriage. When we come to Romans chapter 5, Paul will very clearly talk about 
in Adam all sinned. In Christ are all made alive. And talk about Adam as an actual human being from whom all human beings come. It's the central to his theology. And you begin to think of what he says in chapter 15 of the book of 1 Corinthians when he says in the same way, uh, in Adam all die. And then he will say the first one, Adam, became a living soul. So it is the consistent witness of the Old Testament and the New Testament that there was not only man who came to be created, but there was an original couple, Adam and Eve, from whom everyone else has come on planet Earth. That's a kind of starting point for our understanding of man and understanding that we are God's special creatures created by him. Now, the implications of that are multitudinous, and we'll get to some of them, but let me just at this point notice three. First of all, we are designed and purposeful beings. We're not the results of random fate. We are designed and purposeful. We're not derived products of a, an unguided process. Secondly, we are dependent beings. We are not the masters of our own fate. We are dependent upon God. We are created so there is a creator who stands over us. Part of what's going on in the gender issue is a larger question. And the larger issue is who are we as human beings? And the idea is, and it's grounded, it's rarely put in these terms in our culture, but it's there, is that we are individuals who are ultimately only accountable to ourselves and to our feelings and to our desires and what we choose to be. I have the right to define my gender. I have the right to define my identity. And no one else has the right to interfere in that particular decision. But the Bible comes and insists, no, you are a dependent being. You are not self-defined or self-defining. Um, it, it is interesting how we change language. And you, you, you'll notice very carefully now that when uh, children are born, we are told that they are assigned a gender as if Somebody who puts down M or F at that moment is assigning randomly. Anyway, I, I won't go further on that. We're going, to come back, <laughs> we're going to come back to this in a couple of weeks when we talk about marriage because this is an issue that lies very close to the heart, not just about marriage, but our society. This, this is a fundamental issue where Christians are going directly in conflict with the culture. And there are going to be long-term consequences for that in our public school system, in our hospitals, in all kinds of ways that are just beginning to be seen at this point. And if we are dependent beings, we are also accountable beings. We're accountable to God himself. And so we are people who have a special origin. We are God's direct creation. Secondly, we are people who have a unique identity, a special identity. We are made in the image of God. And this is the uh, central part of what this passage says, is the Lord in verse uh, 26 says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. And then it is said in a couple of verses later, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, the first thing that that means is that we bear the image of God upon us uniquely. It can be said of no other creature on this earth. That is not a statement of speciesism as we're told, to define the right of one species over another is, uh, is a sin akin to racism. No, we uniquely, of all creatures God has made, bear the image of God. Even angels are not said to bear the image of God, as human beings bear the image of God. Now, the word image is a word that looks at a representation. And... Um, it was often used, for example, of a king in the ancient world who would have his image stamped on a coin. 
Most people who lived at a distance for Rome, for example, had no idea what the Caesar looked like. The closest they would get was to look at that representation on the coin, the image of him that in some way bore a likeness to the reality of, uh, of who the emperor was. The word likeness comes alongside and, and seems to say the same kind of thing. There seems to be very little uh, reason that we should try to find a difference between what it means to be in the image of God and in the likeness of God. What, what it's saying is simply this, God is the original of which we are the copy in some particular way. Now, clearly that's not primarily or, or even necessarily at all physical because God is spirit. And so the image isn't, it may be reflected in our body in some particular way, but it's not that we have a body because God does not have a body. And uh, theologians and Bible scholars debate back and forth, and I'm not going to go into that debate this morning to try and think about this, but as I... I, I, as I think about it, I find it best to say that when God talks about us being in the image of his image, it refers to that complex of things that makes us resemble God and not simply animals. That there's a quantum difference between human life and all other kinds of life. So I came up with a list this week, and you can do with it what you want, of eight different elements of, uh, of the image of God. First of all, we are spiritual beings. We are made with the capacity to fellowship with God. We're made with the capacity, as the writer of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes says, he has put eternity in our hearts. And in contrast to all other beings, there is a God consciousness and a God centeredness and a capacity and a relationship to him that is significant. Secondly, we are personal beings. We have our own identity. Now, it may be confused, as we've been talking about, but still there is a sense of who we are in distinction from others. Thirdly, to be in the image of God means that we are personal beings. That is that, um, pardon me, I already said personal. We are relational beings that we are given with a capacity to relate to one another. We've talked about the Trinity as the essence of God, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live in a connection of love with one another, and our capacity to make relationships and to enter into those relationships is part of the image of God. Fourthly, we are moral and ethical beings. We have a sense of what is right and what is wrong. We don't act simply on instincts. Well... All too often we do. But what separates us is even if we act on instincts, we are morally responsible for those instincts. No one blames a lion for taking down an antelope in the open plain. But human beings killing others is an act for which they are morally responsible, whether for good or for wrong. Fifthly, we are rational beings. We have the capacity to intellectualize, to think, to uh, understand the world and to reason in those particular ways. Uh, sixth, we are volitional beings. We have a will. We have the ability to make choices. Seventh, we are emotional beings, some of us more than others, who have the capacity for joy and sadness and grief at very significant and intuitive ways. And eighth, we are creative beings. Maybe in some ways that comes very close to what is involved here because God the great creator is making us an image and even as we think about the creativity represented by humanity in all of its various forms, it is part of the image of God. Another thing I want you to notice as we think about those components is that the image of God involves male and female. So it was said with great clarity in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Maleness and femaleness combine together in some way to fulfill the sense in which we are the image of God. They are innate capacities. 
They are not merely peripheral to our being. They are not secondary to our being. Maleness and femaleness go right down to the basis of who we are in the presence and nature of God. And so sexuality is part of our being. And that's why all of the discussion of gender as a chosen identity comes right to the heart of things. Sadly, I think many of the issues involve keep us from helping people. I was watching television the other day and some mother was talking about her four-year-old who had declared that she really wanted to be a boy. And now the mother was in rewriting all of history because a four-year-old had told her something and is casting her in a particular role that probably when uh, the adolescent years are in is going to change very significantly. But rather than being told, you've got a problem that we need to work with, she, they, they are being told, you've got, a, you've got an identity that we need to transform in some particular way or support anyway. Now, uh, um, a, a final thing I want to say about the image of God is that sin defaced the image, but it did not erase it. The image of God continues even after the fall. So while we are fallen creatures, we are still image bearers of God. The image is not all that it ought to be. And uh, I'll come back to that in just a moment. But in uh, chapter 5, after the fall, Moses will write, This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made them in the likeness of man, male and female. He created them and he blessed them and named them man. And when he, Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his own image and named him Seth. Now it is after his own likeness and his own image, but that image and likeness was God's image in his life. And in chapter 9, it will give the command of God related to capital punishment, and it will say, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. So now we've entered into the point where the reason that murder is wrong is because you are killing an image bearer at this particular point. In the book of James, chapter 3 and verse 9, it is talking about the way in which we speak and use our tongue. And it's talking about, on one point, we can praise God, and on the other term, curse men who are made in the image of God. And Paul is saying, or James is saying, rather, that our tongues can defy the reality of the image of God that is born even after sin. Now let's think about the implications of that because they are immensely profound and significant. Think on the one hand about what it is like to deny that. One of the best known uh, ethicists of our time who teaches at Princeton is a man named Peter Singer. And Peter Singer is a leader in the movement that says a child um, can be born, but a child is no more human when they're first born because they're utterly dependent than a monkey is. And so we need to wait for six months or so before we declare them human. And before that, we can treat them in a particular way. And also he is big on what is called speciesism, which I've already mentioned, the idea that there is something more value about a human life than the other, than other forms of life. So he writes this, the fact that a being is a human being in a sense of a member of the species Homo sapiens is not rel relevant to the wrongness of killing it. it is rather characteristics like rationality, autonomy, and self-consciousness that make a difference. Infants lack these characteristics. Killing them, therefore, cannot be equated with killing normal human beings or any other self-conscious being. So to kill a Down syndrome child five months after they're born is an act with no moral significance. To kill an adult lying helpless in old age on a bed has no moral significance either because the image of God is something, pardon me, the, the uh, humanity of someone is related on whether or not they can relate to, anyway, we can go on and you can see it. But let me say in contrast 
The biblical view is that you will never look into the eyes of a single human being on earth who is not made in the image of God. You will never encounter in whatever circumstance a human who is not an image bearer. Broken as that image may be because of the effects of sin. And that has huge implications for all kinds of issues in the times in which we live. Racism, where it's easy to look on someone and say, well, they're not of the same color or background than I am. And the scripture comes along and says they are image bearers of God. And one of the great tragedies of the legacy of, of slavery is that people were not even counted as human beings. What, they were considered, what, two-thirds of a person in terms of the, the way in which the American government defined them because of the institution of, of slavery. And, and, and we need to recognize that. When we are talking about issues like abortion, we, we are talking about image bearers. So that when you look on that ultrasound picture, you are seeing the picture of an image bearer as you watch that, and not simply a fetus or a, 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 a coming together blob of embryos. We think of what the implications of that are for the poor and the marginalized, who it's easy to dismiss, but to recognize that they are image bearers of God and need to be treated in such a particular way. We think of it in terms of areas like immigration. And in all of our discussion about immigration, and we can have political differences about how we understand that, but we are talking about real human beings. And we are talking about image bearers who must be treated with dignity. That isn't to say that they shouldn't be treated with justice, but much of the discussion treats people, even in their sinfulness and brokenness, as if they are of no value and of no significance. We think about end-of-life issues, and we think about euthanasia. And we need to understand that there is an issue of image-bearing and what it means to be an image-bearer at that particular place. I put in your notes, I'm not sure whether I changed it, but um, that Human beings have intrinsic value, not just instrumental value. Instrumental value means, well, they're valuable because they do this. They perform that. Intrinsic value means they have value apart from what their effectiveness is, about what their value is in terms of what they are contributing at that point to society. And of course, we're never in a position to evaluate what their ultimate value is. But um, as Christians, we need to come to grips with what that means and understand the implications of many of these issues because huge number of issues in our society are ultimately image bearer issues whatever our political understanding is. Well, the third thing, we are people with a special origin. We are God's direct creatures. We are people with a special identity. We are image bearers. And we are people with a divinely given responsibility. We are stewards of God's creation. So it's interesting as God describes the humans that he is making. And he describes what they're role is. He says in verse 28, and God said to them, it, it's interesting that having created them, this is the first thing, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now you'll notice there's really three commands, fill, subdue, have dominion. Filling is relatively obvious. They had a whole world to fill, two people, and a vast world. And filling and multiplying meant, on one sense, populating the earth. But it also meant spreading social culture. It also meant spreading the reality of the human presence in different ways. So it's both physical, the filling of the earth, and it's also cultural in that sense. 
Subduing the earth is an interesting thought, isn't it? God put humans in the earth to subdue it. In chapter 2, he'll create Adam and he'll put him in the garden to keep it. Now, it, 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 he didn't put man in a perfect environment and say, fill the earth and enjoy it. He said, subdue it. He created the world, if I can put it this way, intentionally dependent on the human presence to enable it to realize its potential. So there's a certain sense in which nature needs to be subdued. It needs to be brought under control. Even before the fall brought weeds and thorns and thistles and all of those kind of things, Adam still needed to keep the garden. He needed to prune the trees. He needed to uh, cut back new, and I don't know all the things he needed to do. But subduing was part of God's command and bringing it under control. And then the third part was have dominion, rule. But the important thing is the ruling is under the stewardship of God. It is God's earth, not man's. And God calls us to rule the earth by means of being caretakers of it, by being stewards of it for God's glory. Now, all of this has implications, and it's, I think, fairly evident but what some of those implications are. On the first hand, humans are to value the earth, but they're not to deify it. They're not to worship it. One of the great tendencies of humanity down through the centuries has been to deify the earth, to worship the earth, and to give it more value than it rightly possesses. Humans are called to worship God and to value creation and use it. On the other hand, subduing it and having dominion over it means we don't denigrate it. We don't treat it lightly. We don't treat it cheaply. The command to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it is a call to creation care. And that responsibility continues even after the fall that we are to use the earth and we're to think of caring for it. Christians care about the environment. Christians back away from exploiting the earth and there's fine lines between where we are exploiting and destroying or whether we are using, subduing, and enhancing and sustaining what God has intended. And we know that's one of the major discussions that goes on in our world today. But this command of God says that Christians need to be environmentally concerned and environmentally uh, reacted, not necessarily going along with every kind of wind of things that comes through, but to recognize that we are caretakers of this earth. We do not know when the time has come as the Lord Jesus is going to return. And, uh, and, and the earth as we presently know it is going to be reshaped and refashioned. God has not given us inside information on that. So until the Lord comes, we are to care for the earth and to prepare for its longevity. It's God's hand to determine when it's destroyed or renewed and refashioned, not ours. One of the things that becomes evident as we think through these things, we are God's special creation. We have a unique dignity and we have a God-given responsibility. There's a big difference between the very good of Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and the way the world is today. And it's a reminder of the impact of sin and the effect of sin. But it's an also an entree into the reality of what the gospel is about. Because the gospel is all about the one who in Colossians 1, it says, the one who was in the image of God, became man for us. We are image bearers, but Jesus is the precise image of the invisible God. All that God is, he is. And he took up our humanity and became like us in all of those ways of humanity. 
And one of his purposes was not only to die and to take our place, but as Ephesians chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 3 say, to renew the image of God within us. So when we, begin to, when we trust Christ, image renewal is underway. We are image bearers broken. But God is renewing his image within us. He is making us more and more like Christ so that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. And God's purpose is that when Christ appears, we will be like him, bearing the image that God intended us to have. And in the new heavens and the new earth, when God creates them, we will be perfected image bearers who enjoy all that God would have loved for Adam and Eve to enjoy and far more and experience it flawlessly forever. And that really brings us to the table, to the reality that God sent his son in the image of broken image bearers to bear our sin and to bear our brokenness and to take our place on the cross. And that's what we remember when we come to the table. Again, for some of you who are new to us, it's our custom to come to the Lord's table every Sunday morning when we gather together. And come recognizing this is not the table of Redeemer Fellowship, it's the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you know him as your Lord and Savior, if you've trusted him, if you're walking in fellowship with him, he invites you to take these symbols, to take the bread and remember that he gave his life for you on the cross, that he shed his blood so that you might be forgiven to pay the penalty of your sins. And he invites you, if you've never trusted him, to trust him to receive the gift of eternal life in and through him. So in a moment, we are going to take the bread and the wine together. We'll sing a song. At least a song will be played that some of you may not know. Others of you will know. You can join in and sing as you want. But fill your hearts with this. this is, these are words of a prayer. Uh, just acknowledging the greatness and goodness of God and the wonder of our Savior. And uh, we'll distribute the symbols. They will be uh, um, taken together after they're all distributed. So I will lead us in that particular part. And then after we've taken, you can pass the, the little uh, cups to the end aisles, the, the outside aisles, and someone will pick them up. So Father, we come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior. We come to you knowing that you made us in your image and yet we've rebelled against you but rather than simply devastating us and erasing us from existence you purpose to redeem us at the cost of sending your son as one among us the true image bearer but he not only bore our image he bore our sins and he bore our penalty and he took them to the cross. I pray now as we give thanks that you would fill our hearts with great gratitude and praise to our Savior in whose name we pray. Amen. Triune God, we have <clears throat> sung about the ministries that you all have as we come to remember especially our Lord and Savior. Who could have thought that a lamb, your lamb, could rescue the souls of men. You are not bought with corruptible things, but with silver, such as silver and gold, but with precious blood, as of a lamb without blemish and spot. Lord Jesus, we take this bread as we give you thanks for being our sin bearer. And this cup, as we remember your life poured out in sacrifice for us. 
Thank you, our Savior. Well, we are going to uh, collect the cups and at the same time we'll call in a moment for those who are taking the offering to do so. And we're going to close with another song which will be uh, new to some of you. Um, when my daughter died, I was uh, just overwhelmed with the thought of the faithfulness of God and I went on and I collected a whole bunch of, I have a playlist of 15 songs on the faithfulness of God that I just love to play over and over. And um, this is one of those. I'd not heard it. Um, it was on some obscure album. But I want to warn you as we sing it together, it has got one of those, it's very simple uh, and the words are very easy, but beware of it. It's addictive. It will run through your mind this <laughs> week. But I can't think of any better words to run through your mind than Oh, what a faithful God I have, faithful in every way. So we'll wait on you for the offering. It's going to sing the first verse, or they're going to sing the first verse twice. Why don't you remain seated during the first verse? And then when it's repeating it, we'll stand and sing the rest of it. Said, Amen. Amen. Yes. yes. Father, help us to walk knowing your faithfulness, bearing your image, representing you in ways that glorify you and care for and show love to others. In Christ's name, amen.